Good evening, everybody. Hello, and welcome to another Tuesday show. Today, I have something delicious and sweet for you. We are going to be discussing the chocolate industry, particularly in England, and how various developments within the English chocolate making industry give us what we have today, all those delicious sweets that we have today. And we're also going to look at maybe some of the other side of it, how the chocolate industry was quite um, different in its approach to working conditions, industry, and how maybe we can learn from that today. Thinking, of course, a few weeks ago, we did a stream on John Ruskin and William Morris, very relevant in that regard. Of course, I'm going to be joined by a host of wonderful characters to help discuss this. And let me introduce them in turn. So uh, first, regular co-host on this stream, Rupert August. Hello, sir. How are you doing? Hello, I'm doing well. Good to be back. Although uh, I do fear that this one might be a little bit further outside my expertise than usual. Oh, surely with your knowledge of revolutions throughout history and medieval restorationism, this is the perfect stream for you, Rupert. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Did, uh, I, I wanted to ask before we get going, is there anything that you've been reading lately, not necessarily to do with chocolate, that you would recommend? Ooh, good question. Um, not in particular that's coming to mind. I've been reading a few things recently, but uh, yeah, nothing, I, nothing that I would push to the forefront and say that everyone should go read. Oh, well, you've saved us some time there, I suppose. That's that's <laughs> something. Uh, well, great to have you. And, and what's your favorite chocolate, Rupert? Um, hmm, good question. I I still quite like just the, the regular old um, dairy milk. Just oh, uh, standard classic. dairy milk. Yeah. Pure, you can't beat it, right? It's just pure chocolate. Pure chocolate. Well, uh, we shall see if the others like that too. Uh, let me introduce again another regular on English restoration. Daughter of Albion, how are you doing? Hello. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Thank you for having me this evening. Nice to be back. Oh, it's great to have you back. Yeah, uh, pleasure. So, um, what is your favourite chocolate? Daughter I'm a bit of, of a simp for Galaxy, which I know feels a bit... I don't know if it has the prestige of Cadbury's, but I, yeah, I've got a bit of a thing. Although I do like a Cadbury's uh, caramel egg at Easter as well, yeah. Oh, I mean, that's just a tradition now, isn't it? You've got to have isn't one it? for Easter. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to yeah. go really posh, I, I quite like the Charbonnel and Walker ones, but <laughs> the, only because of the nice packaging. <laughs> oh, you see, that that's an important point, though, isn't it? It's like it's not just the taste. There's a whole experience with chocolate, right? Oh, absolutely! It, it comes in the nice little velvet box with the ribbon and the you know the pink sort of satin on the inside. Very charming. <laughs> I, I actually found because um, originally. I'm sure we'll get to this at some point, but the originally chocolate wasn't sold in wrappers. It was sold in boxes and they used to paint them. And I found one. I'll share it now. Um, let's see, is this going to work? It was um, Arthur Rackham, who was an, a children's illustrator. Oh, illustrator. Yeah, he has beautiful illustrations. Mm. This one here is... Uh, oh, wow, that's beautiful. I had no idea he'd made chocolate boxes. Oh, that's stunning. Yeah, oh, so lovely. return. This is what they've taken from us. Uh, Retro, they say. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. And uh, is it? Mm, I, I, have you been reading anything that you would recommend? I've been trying. I um last Christmas I decided I wanted to read all of Dickens, so I'm now on Doombie and Son, but I've only just started it. But uh, I will say he's very funny, and I've, I've he's really lifted my mood the last year. So yeah, I'm enjoying Dickens at the moment. That's cool. That's cool. Uh, so <laughs> have you got through quite a number of them? Um, Only very slowly. Probably only about five the last year. So uh, steady, slow and steady. There's quite a few to get through. <laughs> I think it's maybe 52 well, or something, but yeah. We look forward to hearing about the rest in due course. Yes, absolutely. Um, and uh, finally, but not least, we have a special guest today. We have Birdie. Hello, Birdie. How are you doing? Good evening. No, thank you for having me on. But I have to admit, you have invited the one person who may know some about chocolate and love chocolate, but is actually allergic to chocolate. So it's uh... <laughs> oh, <laughs> don't no. ask me. It's horrible. It's horrible. And yeah, I've tried all the chocolates, and I cannot win. So. So this is actually <laughs> a really cruel thing to do to you. It is. Um, yeah, this is yeah. really cruel for me. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, we appreciate your sacrifice. <laughs> uh, the, the um, well, you've get, you've tried all the chocolates. So, did you have a favourite one before you you found? Your I own? have to admit, I was partial to lint chocolate. I mm. did like lint chocolate. It's very smooth. I find that very Moorish. Yeah. That you have a whole box oh, gosh, and then suddenly yeah. it's gone. Yeah. Delicious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and have you been what what is your connection with chocolate what because you, you've you've had some involvement in the past absolutely um so i used to uh work in a victorian port and copper mine um and in doing so i did living history and one of the talks that i did um was a talk and demonstration on the history of chocolate and chocolate experience in victorian england um which is very useful <laughs> for this stream i think um awesome. yeah which i'm sure we'll we'll touch on later so yes yes and um I, finally have you been reading anything that you would recommend at the moment um I've been, uh, there's a new book I've got actually, which again, charity shop find, love charity shop finds. Um, it's called A Year in a Victorian Garden, um, mm. which is very up my street because it's it's very much um, not just what they're growing, but there's a lot of structure around it and how they keep their borders very neat and all these, uh, these lovely straight lines. And of course, finding out which plants they had then and which ones we still use now is always, always good to know about. So. Yeah, it's quite a nice, nice little evening read. <laughs> that sounds good. That sounds good. Uh, for myself, I've been reading a book. Um, what was it called? It's like Jungian symbolism in Wagner's Ring Cycle, which is absolutely wild. I, I'm not, I'm not That's completely incredible. convinced. I mean, it, it, it's great. It's great. It's. I'm not completely convinced by all of the interpretation, mm -hmm. but I've learned a lot about what. What would you call it? Uh, the eternal feminine, the uh, animus and the anima. I'm like, okay, everything must be reduced to this now um, in mythology. It's, it's interesting. It's interesting. I'd recommend yes. it. Um, Actually, yes. that, that, that illustrator Sorry. you just showed at the start, Arthur Rackham, he he, he illustrated uh, lots of Wagner's um, musical sheets as well. You might like looking into him on that. Yeah, I, I've come across some of them and they're, they're absolutely brilliant portrayals mm. aren't they yeah beautiful um they may be appearing on the channel soon we'll see um <laughs> taster for everybody uh so let's get into chocolate uh, and we'll start with a little bit of the history of chocolate and uh i'll, I'll kind of go through a wee bit and feel free to just jump in guys when when you feel like uh so the history of chocolate well it starts out pretty ancient in south america you have uh, the cacao trees, which have these pods, and within them there's the cocoa beans, as it were. And originally, these would have been uh, used to produce a, a liquid, a very bitter liquid that would be drunk. And it was cocoa is uh, the food of the gods, is what it actually means in that period. Uh, the cacao, I think it's... Um, Oh, I've, I've got it. It's, it's a juice of some kind that they would birth, bitter juice or something like that. Um, in the 16th century, that's when it actually takes on another level because the Aztec king or emperor used cocoa beans as a form of currency and tribute would be paid to him in the form of cocoa beans. Of course, just around the corner, the conquistadors start coming into South America during that period. And that's when uh, cocoa really comes back into Europe. Now, they weren't too sure about it at that point. You get a lot of conquistadors saying, we're not convinced by this drink. The Aztecs love it. They think it's the food of the gods. We don't think it's that tasty. But it gets brought back to the court of Charles V. And there, a number of uh, figures work on it and introduce sugar to the drink, making it much sweeter. And it becomes much more popular within a European context. Very um, high elite culture would be engaging in it during the, 
the 17th and 18th centuries. Birdie, you want to come in? <laughs> you saw me take my mic off then. Um, yeah, no, I was just going to comment saying that um, around sort of the similar time, coffee houses um, and coffee mm. beans were also being brought in. Um, but chocolate did actually overtake coffee at one point. So you had the, the cocoa houses instead. And not only did they just use sugar, they did use a lot of spices in their cocoa. So they tended to use um, a lot of cinnamon, allspice, that sort of thing to kind of take away the bitterness, but bring out more of the flavours. So in terms of just being a, a chocolate flavour, I don't know if anybody's ever had um, pure chocolate, but it's incredibly bitter, um, more bitter than coffee. So hence why our coffee then overtook took again <laughs> until we uh, figured out what to do with this stuff. <laughs> it's, it, it's quite a shock to the system when you have it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you Absolutely. can only have a little bit of time, really. Yeah. Um, but but on well, I'll I'll come to maybe what some of those shocking effects uh, might have produced. Um, Rupert, come in, come in. Rupert. Yes. So I was going to say that it, the 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 way that these two things coincide, uh, i.e., uh, cocoa and sugar, is quite interesting in itself because separate separately, sugar itself just sort of on on its own was uh, growing in popularity over the 16th century, particularly as a very aristocratic um luxury uh and, and like a way of uh, flaunting wealth and such so as i recall uh, it was it was a big thing to be making sugar sculptures for uh particular like particularly royal or grandiose banquets and things and uh as i recall elizabeth elizabeth the first was quite fond of them supposedly it gave her quite bad teeth because she uh she was a bit addicted yeah, famously, she had very bad teeth. Yeah, and, and Marie Antoinette, I know, who had a real, um, I mean, more of the kind of sugary macaron type, uh, sugared mm. um, rose petals rather than chocolate, but seems they had a bit of a sweet tooth. Yeah, and I, I think I think that's really key. It was a luxury item, right? It was elite, and the very high courts would be drinking this stuff. And at the coffee houses, it's going to be your your local notables. It's not a drink for everybody at this point. Um, and but it also has another dimension to it that I did want to raise quite early, and maybe this poem from the 17th century will give you a, a hint at it. Twill make old women young and fresh, create new motion of the flesh, and cause them long for you know what, if they but taste of chocolate. And there was, and from Aztec, the Aztecs had this view, and it gets carried over into Europe that chocolate's an aphrodisiac, that if you drink it, it's actually going to, well, it helps women to conceive, it helps men woo lovers, and I don't think it's any surprise when you read the Marquis de Sade, for example, there's multiple instances where he's he's giving people chocolate and they're suddenly in frenzies of romance and can't restrain their passions anymore. Uh, it's There's this very strong connection between uh, chocolate and the arousal of romantic erotic passion i just wanted to to add on that one nathan in terms of there is a lot of truth in that um so there, there is a reason mm. as to why we gift chocolates at valentine's day as well um and chocolate along with a lot of other things does have um, an addictive property to it so that was another reason as to why they thought that it was an aphrodisiac um, slash sort of is an aphrodisiac because uh, especially women on a certain time of the month, should we say, they will crave things such as chocolate because it does it does make you feel a certain way. It's, it's comforting. So it does have a very comforting um, act on the actual brain in terms of being an aphrodisiac and being addictive. Um, I mean, decent chocolate. So <laughs> if you have some very good chocolate, um, it will actually make you feel a certain way which is quite impressive for a natural substance yeah i think it's there's a compound uh phenylethylamine i think which is the chemical the brain releases when a, a person experiences attraction so yes that could well be it yeah and uh, i think as well this is probably why chocolate's also associated with the devilish to a certain extent it's uh it's indulgent it's it's greedy. It's it's all of these emotions at, at one time. Um, so that's an interesting kind of subplot when we come to maybe how it develops in England in, in a very short time. We'll come to that, where it's primarily hardcore Quakers who are producing chocolate and how they 
they try to manage some of that uh, tension, perhaps. Yeah, that's what I was just going to bring up is the uh, mm. the question of whether or not that's like how, how recent some of that association is, perhaps because uh, the Quakers, again, to skip ahead a little bit, were uh, pursuing confectionaries because they pursued it as a more moral alternative to uh, many of the other things that are around, in particular alcohol, that would uh, fulfill the same niche. Yeah, well, well, let, let's kind of come to that situation um, because we're moving into towards the end of the 18th century, the beginning of the 19th century, and you have a number of Quaker families going into the chocolate industry. We have the Fries at the end of the 18th century. We have the Cadburys, I think it's 1826, and you have Roundtrees as well. Up and they're across the country, so in Bristol, the Fries, Cadburys of Birmingham and round trees in York, and also Terry's as well, up in Yorkshire. And uh, part of why Quakers go into this is because there's a number of restrictions upon them during this period. So they couldn't go to university, for example, because you had to have be an Anglican to go to university before uh, the lifting of um, restri religious restrictions. They couldn't serve as members of parliament in the early 19th century. They couldn't serve in various legal professions because they were unwilling to take oaths. And they couldn't join the military because Quakers are pacifist. So they're automatically barred from a certain number of professions if they're wanting to, to ascend in the, in the hierarchy. And so business becomes one of the most obvious uh, pointers in that regard. And manufacturing and industry is obviously blowing up during the, the, the Victorian era. But why, why chocolate in particular? Well, um, as Rupert mentioned, one of the reasons is Quakers were primarily against alcohol and alcohol consumption, uh, not just on a kind of um, basic level of this is wrong, but also because of its perceived social evils. During this time, many, many uh, temperance movements sprung up because a lot of the... Um, well, the condition of the working working man and his family, uh, the poverty that people were living in, the rates of child illegitimacy, and and the spread of uh, sexual uh, in diseases and so on, they were all kind of traced back to alcoholism. Uh, the effects that alcohol has upon uh, what you can what you earn because. Well, you've earned so much, but then you're spending it on booze rather than on your family. So therefore, it's a cause of your poverty. There's also the fact that it it kind of changes your emotions, your behaviors. And so you're more likely to have an affair while you're while you're drunk, for example. You're more likely to um, be abusive to your partner, for example, or your children. So the this and, and it causes disease as well. So. Uh, chocolate was a, a viable alternative, trying to out-compete alcohol, creating these uh, chocolate houses where people could go and drink chocolate or coffee instead of alcohol. So it, was, um, it wasn't just uh, an opening in the market, it was actually part of a social program, you might say, to overcome the evils of society. It must be said, though, uh, that something does seem to have happened uh, probably towards the end of the 18th century, if not a little bit afterwards, in order for us to sort of get into this position where it's viable to market uh, confectionaries. I, I don't know how much, to, to what extent it was generally confectionaries among the Quakers rather than uh, specifically chocolate, but obviously chocolate is, it becomes the main thing that they're remembered for. Um, for that to be viable, to market that to the kind of mass market where it would become a social program, something has happened that has made these products far more available uh, or just generally lower lower in price because in the even as late as the very late 18th century possibly the early 19th century confectioners are still ex exceedingly expensive in order to sort of have on retainer in an aristocratic household and other than that to my knowledge there's not really that much access to sugar on, on like enough of a scale in order to make a confectionery industry as we would understand it wide scale so yeah although although there are all these things all these problems um, it does seem like certain things like sugar and and cocoa are being more are more widely available. So that's something to bear in mind, perhaps, about this period. Yeah, just to to add on that, actually, um, Rupert, um, cacao beans were being used as a currency, 
um, at one point. So not necessarily in this country, but ac across the world, especially when they were first found, they were being used as a currency um, because they were quite hard. Well, they were seen, seen as quite hard to grow, quite hard to come by. Um, and of course, you got chocolate out of it, which was very, very much um, a product that, that everybody wanted. So just like sugar, um, everybody wanted it. But unlike sugar, um, it was used as a currency. So in terms of it actually being traded for other goods, so it was, uh, became very popular in this country because it was actually traded for goods that we had um, for the cacao beans. So it was it became very, very popular over here because it was so easy to be able to trade it for what we had rather than actually paying money for it. Um, so it actually became easy to get hold of for this country. I don't know if that helps at all with the <laughs> it being so popular. Well, it, it um, obviously, because it's something of a central artery, really, to our former empire, uh, obviously chocolate being mostly sugar and cocoa. So you're, you're right, Birdie. I mean, naturally coming from West Africa, much like, I suppose, really, it's at the heart of a very powerful imperial Britain. So exotic and expensive and obviously at that point highly desirable as a foreign import, um, which I suspect is why it has such a um, you know, considerable social desirability as well. Um, at, for the time and onward, I mean, I assume that's where Cadbury's and Bourneville and whatnot are are taking most of their ingredients. I'm not sure though, but yes, yes, and uh, I, I think um, I, I think Rupert's right that up until about 1850, it's still a luxury drink. So it's middle classes and uh, the very elite who are going to be drinking chocolate because they they because the price is still so high. But it is through the imperial connections, which all of this is possible for the first time. Um, but certain changes take place around 1850, which allow it become to become a mass market uh, operation. And uh, uh, Birdie, you want to come in here? So <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. So in terms of um, obviously around 1850, which I'm assuming you'll go into in a moment, um, Fry's chocolates were the first ones to actually make a chocolate bar. Um, and that was in 1847. So in, in a couple of years beforehand, you, they've managed to produce this product that was initially very, very sought after, but was only a drink that you had to add yet more expensive products to in order to make it um, tasty in a way. Um, so they managed to turn it into something that was easily available. So I think that might lead into what you're about to, mm -hmm. to say in terms of in terms of the 1850s. Yes, so that that was one of the key key moments because, um, well, before that point, you had in in Holland the development of a hydraulic press by Van Houten, which allowed for it, it much easier to to get um, basically crush the cocoa beans and get the cocoa out. Um, and and in part of this process, extracting the cocoa butter, uh, right? That's really important. But what Fry's managed to do was to find a way of integrating back in some of that cocoa butter, which allows it to become a moldable uh, form, which can then become edible chocolate. And this is much cheaper than the luxury drink, so it becomes accessible to a mass market. At this, and and as as Birdie says, they developed the first chocolate bar. Uh, at that point, it's the Fry's cream stick, uh, which unfortunately is no longer in existence, but there was very soon after the follow up, uh, the Fry's chocolate bar, uh, chocolate cream, chocolate cream. I've got mm. it here. Yes, <laughs> yes. And uh, uh, I will try it later in the stream, I'm sure. But uh, um, yes. And but the other thing that happens just around this time is William Gladstone manages to get through Parliament a change to the taxes so that it's only cost a penny for a pound of cocoa, cocoa beans. And so the price of importing goes massively down from what it was. And so that makes it much more, much cheaper again. So, and, and I should say as well, the third thing as well, because of fries have access to industrial technologies that weren't really in, weren't really the case with chocolatiers on the continent, like in Switzerland and in France, uh, you know, you've got the the Watt steam engine and so on. They're able to produce uh, these chocolate bars at a rate that nobody else could at that time. So it becomes the first mass marketed chocolate product 
in the world, essentially. Um, so, so the was there any was there anything else around eighteen fifty, Birdie, that I've I've forgotten here? Um, not that I'm aware of. No, there, there does seem to be a bit of a, a lull. So, obviously, in eighteen fifty, chocolate as a consumable product for everyone, so you, mm -hmm. something that you can quite literally pick up off the shelf, um, was mass produced. Um, and obviously, because I mean, we've seen old photos and old um, posters of Fry's chocolates um, everywhere, and they are fantastic. Um, but they are very much ahead of the game, as you say, at this point, um, until the next sort of revolution in chocolate, shall we say, which I'm sure we'll, we'll touch on very soon. Um, but yeah, now I completely agree. They, they had uh, the infrastructure to be able to do this, unlike a lot of the other manufacturers um, who were very slow off the starting pitch in the, in the chocolate game, I have to admit. I believe it is in this intervening period, though, where um, there are a number of more unscrupulous uh, chocolatiers that are sort of taking a certain amount of uh, advantage of the newness of the, the market and, and mixing in certain things to get the right consistency and the right color that uh, made it more appealing, but were not necessarily most healthy, such as brick dust. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's very, very oh. true. It's, I always um, used to refer to this as um, the kind of the bread game, because it was a very similar situation to um, the bread um, in Victorian, in Victorian era, sorry, um, in terms of, you know, adding chalk and arsenic to the bread to try and make it cheaper and more consumable. And the chocolate game was very much the same for a while. Um, so obviously Fry's had figured out how to make a chocolate bar, um, but the other leading names in chocolate were trying to kind of cheat the system um, and make it as cheap and as quick as possible, which obviously was, it may have been an advantage, but didn't get them very far, should we say. <laughs> Well, the thing is that it burns trust very, very quickly. And that's where the, um, so you, you mentioned some of the background of the Quakers not being able to really do much of anything else, but there is also the the angle in which they have a, an advantage due to due to their um, particular convictions in that they were considered more trustworthy. And so the idea was, um, or like the understanding was, I suppose, that the chocolate that was made by Quaker um, merchants was, or chocolatiers was uh, of, a, of a better quality because the Quakers themselves were more trustworthy. I think that comes across as well um, in actually Cadbury's brandings and jumping a little bit ahead here. When uh, there's certain laws that get passed later which prevent you from false advertising that you've got pure chocolate essentially, but Cadbury's is one of the only brands that's renowned for the pure cocoa essence that they were able to extract from the cocoa beans and then also with the the you know the the classic dairy milk uh, a cup and a half of milk is always in their product rather than milk powder there's this strong emphasis on quality and the purity of what they offer uh, and that really relies upon their reputation so I, I think that's a really good point, Rupert. Uh, Birdie. Yeah, no, I was just going to um, comment on what you were saying, actually, in terms of trust. I don't know if anybody remembers when Cadbury's changed their recipe mm. and it, it was all haywire. Everybody kicked up fuss because we'd been so used to the same recipe for centuries um, and then they decided to change it. So I think that does that does play in itself very true to this day. You, know, you trust a product and that's what you buy. Um, and Cadbury's actually did drop sales um, initially when they changed their recipe because people didn't trust it um, as much as the original because it's not something that you would necessarily change. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think as well, when um, when they were bought over by Kraft as well, that was also a, a moment when people sort of lost a bit of trust in them um, because there was this sense that, oh, it's Kraft, this American uh, food industry they don't have the same values necessarily as what Cadbury was founded upon. Yeah, I felt like the loss of a national institution somehow. Mm. That sounds daft, I know, but it did. <laughs> it, it really did. It really did. Mm. It felt like um, a part of our tradition and culture and heritage mm. was just up for sale. And I guess it was, but uh, um, it felt a wee bit more than that, than just another company in a way. Uh, 
maybe it was just their really good marketing to, to an extent. Um, but yeah, so so during that period, you kind of have a wild west, I suppose, of of the chocolate industry. Um, I think it's around the 1870s that you start to see some of the processes come a little bit more into into or some further developments. You have, for example, uh, Henry Nestle was able to develop um, powdered milk, and this was then introduced to um, chocolate, edible chocolate, which at that point would have been a, a form of dark chocolate, to produce milk chocolate for the first time. And uh, it's also around this period that you start to get uh, conching. So, Birdie, do you want to tell us a little bit about the conching process of what it, what it does to chocolate? Yeah, so I'll tell you a little story. It might make more sense. Um, so we all know Lindt chocolate, so Lindor. Um, so Rudolf Lindt was the first man to create this conching method or conching machine. Now, this actually came out by a mistake. Um, so as every chocolate producer at the time had, they had machines that stirred the chocolate during the day. That was that was it, you know, just to keep it keep it moving. Obviously, you need it in liquid form to produce um, solid items. So one day the machine was left on by mistake overnight. And when they came back in in the morning, they found out that the chocolate was a lot smoother um, and a lot creamier. And this was purely down to the fact that it had more air mixed into it. So in 1874, uh, Rudolf Lintz then created this conching machine. And essentially what it does is it's uh, it keeps the chocolate at about body temperature. You don't really want it any hotter than that because you can um, alter the taste of the chocolate. If anyone's ever burnt chocolate, it's horrible. <laughs> it's horrendous stuff. Um, so you want it at a nice constant temperature, no hotter than body temperature. Um, and it basically has a, a wheel that kind of acts as a paddle. So it will scoop the chocolate up and then bring it back round and drop it back into the tank. And it will constantly keep doing this. Um, so in terms of the, the conching method, this is why Lindor is very well known for having very shiny chocolate. I don't know if anyone's ever actually noticed how shiny Lindor chocolate is. If you haven't, then I, I advise you, you hold, let's say, a Cadbury's bar next to, next to a Lindor bar. Um, this is why they're, they're known for having the shiny chocolate was because of the conching method. Um, so since the machine was made, every um, chocolate manufacturer today um, has conching machines. So every single uh, factory, every uh, chocolate manufacturer, all the big names have conching machines. Um, later on for the machines, they did actually add an addition of the shaker plate. Um, which was basically, a, a, it kind of looks like a dish rag. <laughs> so it's a lot of uh, long bars that sat on top of the um, sort of vat of chocolate. Um, there you go. <laughs> so that's a smaller version of oh, a conch wow. machine. You can, you can get ones with wheels as well, um, which kind of looks like a mini water wheel within the, the sort of drum of chocolate. Um, the shaker plates were kind of used for when you were filling up your trays. Um, so if anybody's ever seen uh, chocolate bars being made, they'll fill it up and then they'll shake it out to get the initial uh, layer. So that's what they used to do in terms of being able to actually recycle the chocolate as well. So it's uh, the conching method is very important in terms of keeping the chocolate moving. You never want to let the chocolate stay static um, because all of the oils and all the fats will separate. Um, so I hope, I hope that makes makes a bit more sense in terms of why lint chocolate is uh, very smooth. But yeah, the conching machine and method now is is very important in the chocolate industry. That was really and awesome. you seem to do demonstrations of it, did you? Was that is that right or? Yes, yeah. So oh, we yeah. had um, mm. we had a conching machine at work. Um, I keep pointing behind me because that's what I used to do. I used to I used to stand in front of it. Um, <laughs> but they are very very noisy machines. I have to admit they are very noisy. Yeah. Um, we had a, a small one, so it was probably you know sort of this sort of high. I was going along my fireplace. Um, I, I, I would say about the size of a, a normal dinner table sort of length. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's a case of you can put. So we used to use Belgian chocolate um, 
scandal i know being in <laughs> being in a victorian <laughs> port copper mine horrendous as you know the shaking his head at me um so we used to get the pure chocolate uh, pellets which we would then pour into the machine so you can use the conching method with solid chocolate and then melt it um, but you have to have the correct um, level of chocolate to be able to melt and then uh, let it set and remelt over and over again um, you can't do that with regular chocolates um, a lot of the large manufacturers now their conching machines will go on 24 7 they do not turn them off um, it's a machine that's on all the time to keep this chocolate moving um, but yeah no they are quite fun to work with i have to admit and they do just spread this aroma of chocolate all over the room which is very nice <laughs> That must have been what I could smell because I, I used to live near um, Bourneville's uh, Cadbury's chocolate plant mm -hmm. and you'd wake up in the mornings and go outside and you could smell the chocolate for a couple yes. of miles around. So it must be the conching part yeah. of it. Which yeah, was doing absolutely. That. Yeah. Um, and that, again, is when you heat it up to the body temperature, that's when all the aromas come through as well. Um, again, if you've ever burnt chocolate, it does not smell like chocolate anymore. <laughs> it will smell horrendous. Um, so you have to get it to the right temperature, not only to, to keep it at the right consistency, but it does actually help with all the aromas and the flavours with the chocolate as well. So, Yeah, I think that was a great demonstration. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> much much appreciated. And I, th I think one of the things that it, it points to is that um, when we're looking at the history of chocolate, it's very easy to think of these things coming as um, complete products, like, mm -hmm. oh, Fry's developed the first chocolate bar. Um, but it was only in, uh, what, 1850-odd or whatever, uh, 1847. Uh, so that's quite late in the history. There was a, there yeah. was a lot of uh, yeah. selling the liquid the, before. The mm. conching machine didn't actually mm -hmm. appear until 1874, yeah. Um, so I would say in terms of the chocolate product now, I'm sure, again, we'll touch on it um, later on in the stream, but I would, I actually think it was a, a combination of all of the very large chocolate names, the manufacturers, mm. so Fry's, Cadbury's, Lint, um, all coming together and kind of pinching ideas off each other because um, obviously Fry's, they, they managed to make chocolate into a solid form and then Rudolf Lint created the conching machine um, and I'm sure later on we'll discuss Cadbury's making the first Easter egg and you know things things go on and on and on mm -hmm. they, they work together so well exactly and uh, so just kind of um, rounding off maybe some of this discussion of the history so with certain chocolates might be worth just mentioning here so the Cadbury's dairy milk really only comes into mm -hmm. being at the very beginning of the 20th century that's mm -hmm. when they start adding their own uh, cup and a half of uh, milk to to the product, rather than most chocolates having the the milk powder, and this comes to dominate the market. Um, and in time, uh, and just around the corner, um, Fries developed the Turkish delight during that period, very early on. Uh, probably my favourite. Uh, <laughs> but Fries and Cadbury's joined together. Um, after the turn of the century. Fry's has kind of been beaten by Cadbury's in the market, but they're able to then um, maintain their independent identities under one uh, roof, essentially. All the while in the background, round trees have kind of been going along and they've not been doing so well insofar as uh, the, well, their, their owner, Joseph Roundtree, was not a supporter of advertising. This was one of the issues that Quakers um, had to wrestle with in the chocolate industry because of their emphasis on honesty and, um, well, telling the truth, they felt, many felt that advertising could be quite a manipulative industry. I wonder where they got that idea from, right? Um, wow, that's unheard of today there, isn't it? That's amazing. I know, I know. It must have been dark times back then. Uh, <laughs> But so they didn't advertise initially round trees. They just sold their products to other retailers who would then sell under the, their name. So round trees wasn't so well known at that period. The thing that they really started to, to sell under their own name was the uh, round trees fruit pastels and these sorts of sweeties. And that's how they became known. But in the, the 1920s and 30s, they did start to develop chocolates under their own branding which still with us today the aero was probably their first big breakthrough and then of course there is 
the Kit Kat, the Kit Kat, and this has its own little history because, um, well, it's much cheaper to make than a dairy milk because it's mainly made of biscuit inside, right? It's just chocolate lining on the outside. So it's a cheaper product, and it was initially marketed to the working man. Uh, a, a chocolate that he can have on his break, put in his pack, and go to work. Uh, so take a break. It's literally, you know, on your break, eat your Kit Kat. And it was hugely popular because of that. Um, and then, of course, uh, just another one that I wanted to shout out. Uh, you have Terry's. Uh, also in Yorkshire during this period, and they produce initially the chocolate apple, uh, but this became replaced mm -hmm. by what we know today, the chocolate orange. Uh, don't tap it, whack it, and all that sort of jazz. Um, uh, and I mean, now, it, I, I think you can see that from those kind of early beginnings, we now can see how we ended up with the range of chocolates we have today. Um, but the, maybe the thing to say too is so Kit Kat. If you look at a Kit Kat, it doesn't say it's made by Round Trees. It's made by Nestle, and so Nestle bought out Round Trees. And as we were discussing earlier, Cadbury's fries they are owned by Kraft now. So none of these companies are owned or run by the families that founded them anymore. So they they no longer necessarily have the the values that we're kind of going to go into in a moment. Um, but that has allowed them to have a global audience in a way that maybe they didn't have before. So they, they're able to bring in uh, a bigger revenue than they were able to. Uh, is there anything on the kind of history of chocolate that uh, in this very brief run through that uh, either any of you would like to add? I think it's worth hovering for a moment on just how new a lot of this, uh, a lot of this mm. stuff is, especially the well-known brands are are all from either the quite late 19th century or early 20th century. I was um, it, It's straying a, a little bit away from confectionaries, but uh, still linked in a way. Uh, I was reading about uh, crisps not too long ago, so Walker's crisps, uh, and I was fairly surprised to realize that that was only a, a post-war, like a post-World War II invention, basically. Um, and, and was only popularized from the sort of like 70s and 80s onwards, I think it was. So something that you kind of associate as being a bit ubiquitous was actually very new. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just wanted to comment on the diversity of the, the different chocolates that were actually being produced at the time. Um, so you, know, you didn't just have the drinking chocolate. As soon as the chocolate bars came along, as, as you said, Nathan, you had you know the Kit Kats, the biscuit type chocolates. And then, of course, they started playing with sugar because they thought, you know, well, if we can play with this substance, then why can't we play with this one? Um, I was trying to find a video of the conching machine from work. That's why I was <laughs> sat looking down. Um, I did try and send it to you. I'm not sure if it worked. I will try and post it on Twitter later. I have no idea if this will work, but I don't know if you can see that. But that is the conching machine from uh, from where I used to work. So as you can see, it's got the wheel going round and the top of it there is actually uh, like a scoop. So it scoops it off the wheel, puts it back in, the wheel picks it back up again. Um, so that, that makes a little bit more sense now that <laughs> I've shown you the, the actual conching machine. Yes. Yeah, I, I think um, the... The newness and the variety is quite interesting, isn't it? In terms of, in in the previous streams, we've looked at medieval culture, for example, and Merry England and so on. And, and in some ways, how for somebody um, like William Hazlitt, um, this sort of pleasure side of the Victorian era is a continuation of that. But on the other hand, the range of choice and the, the these very products themselves speak to the... Um, how t how our current moment isn't isn't the norm and actually the it, it's it's just um I, how, how to express it. It, it it's it's a it's a moment in history essentially we take so much of it for granted but the, it didn't have to be this way and it wasn't this way for most of our ancestors and the chocolate bar and the range of choice we have with it is a very new thing for humanity and probably emblematic of consumer culture in general being quite a new thing for uh, humanity to deal with. Um, 
and the effects that I have that's having when it, you know we're, we're still only just learning what that's that's like essentially in terms of um, consumer culture I'd say that chocolate is one of those things that that's never stopped growing you know, it's never stopped producing something new you know every Christmas there's a there's a new advert out for a new flavor or a new bar or there's always achievements um, going on in terms of chocolate and somebody who can't eat chocolate <laughs> um, has it's it's very pronounced how much there is out there you know even just trying to find a biscuit that doesn't have chocolate on it or in it um, you know there's even chocolate chips are in so many different products so it's definitely something that's highly underrated i think in in just today's society let alone um throughout history it's it's always there it's always growing and it's in an unknown number of products that we don't even think about in very different shapes and forms and you've got drinking chocolate you've got cocoa powder you know the list goes on <laughs> yes and um it's also quite because of the chocolate bar form it's also an individual food now in a way that maybe foods in the past were something that you'd have at meal time or that you share with somebody else even drinking chocolate where well, you're going to the the chocolate parlor you're going with your friends to have a drink uh, whereas the chocolate bar you can sit in your room and you can eat it or you, you have it by yourself and that's also reflective of a shift in terms of when we looked at Merry England, these pastimes are shared by a community, by a family, a household. Whereas something like the chocolate bar is symptomatic of a culture which um, is selling to the individual for their pastime and for their escape. Now that might, there, there's good sides to that um, in terms of you can truly go and chase what you're interested in and become a, a real connoisseur of that if, if that's what you want to do. But on the other hand, it it's a way of be, there's it it helps to destroy a common culture, and mm -hmm. because everybody's choosing their own thing to consume, um, and 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 thus reducing those um, reducing something important in the the social fabric. Yeah, absolutely. you mean like the kind of communal? The, sorry, sorry, buddy. Like the you mean like the kind of communal feast, or like sort of to sitting down to share the breaking of bread is that is that what you mean sort of yeah or, or like going so in when we looked at merry england during your feasting time at christmas everybody's feasting together mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i can almost I imagine you... uh, I, I can almost imagine like a, a giant um I feel like a like a uh, like a giant container or cauldron or something of like uh of hot chocolate and uh, and everyone comes along at the feast to like take a take a big cup full <laughs> even though that's that's not a past that actually existed it it almost sounds like it could well there are those sort of chocolate fountains at parties and things but i think that's probably more of a newer yeah. thing again but uh, yeah well i'm mm. thinking i'm thinking in terms of like a, a medieval festival or something of course Obviously, this could i can never almost see it there though <laughs> like we yeah. need to do this now we need to we need to have that cauldron i was just going to say that i think it's very important to to remember that although chocolate itself is very diverse it's also very intimate in terms mm. it can be very personal so you know the chocolate bar you know, a lot of, who shares the chocolate bar i know it's actually like yeah. who actually does do that because I've, <laughs> I've not known many people to buy a chocolate bar who's going to physically share it out you, know, you want to keep that for yourself don't you but you know in terms of the <clears throat> going back in history it's always been very personal so even though it's a case of you they wanted to share it with the world in terms of all these different products you know, it's good to remember that, you know, even a chocolate bar itself, Queen Victoria gifted to the soldiers during the Boer War. Um, again, chocolate bars are gifted. Uh, there's adverts now for, for Cadbury's um, sending chocolate bars anonymously as gifts. You know, so mm -hmm. it is very, very personal, even though it's something that we do all share as a as a collective. Well, um, just as you said, who would you share it with? It reminded me, I think there was an advert once. I don't know if it was Rolos, but who would you share your, who would you give your last Rolo mm, to? Yeah. Was it Rolos? Or maybe Maltesers? Yeah. yeah. Um, but I mean, just just on that point, it, one thing, the first thing I thought of when we you mentioned the topic of chocolate for this evening was, I mean, I know it's more sort of sweets maybe, but it, it made me think of those iconic photographs from 
uh, uh, just after World War II when there was an end to sweet rationing and all the kids are um, basically on the streets just sort of <laughs> making themselves sick, uh, munching on chocolate <laughs> bars and all sorts. And um, there's definitely a kind of, a, I suppose, like a childlike joy and novelty to the role of chocolate socially as well. I mean, I suppose initially I was thinking kind of decadence and indulgence, but, um, but latterly I'd say... I don't know for you guys, but I think every British person has a very fond memory of the local sort of confectionery shop and the, the coming in the white paper bag or the pink and white candy stripe bag. I can almost smell uh, those little shops um, where you'd go and get your sort of pound of or quarter pound of sweets or chocolates. And uh, yeah, I think I was I love those those photographs, though. It's just this kind of unadulterated glee, very charming. And it's um I think that's why everybody has a fondness for it as well. Mm-hmm. Well, you, you definitely couldn't... Uh, well, I, I think um, you look at something like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory by Roald Dahl. Mm. Uh, that, that is very much steeped in British culture. And it. Every, I, I don't know anybody who hates hates that story or hates that film um, from Britain because of that, that spirit in it. It, it captures something of that. Um, there's a certain wholesome delight in the pleasure of of chocolate and just as a an enjoyable pastime in itself uh, mm-hmm. there doesn't have to be any greater reason to it that uh, it's something that we can do in our own time uh, and uh, outside of work and so on uh, th- there's definitely something there well yeah, um, I, I think, think we're all say... dull oh I'm so sorry buddy sorry <laughs> we keep doing that to each other <laughs> I, know. Quite I think it's one of those um indulgences that you don't feel guilty about you know, you, you can go and buy some chocolate and it's it's fine, it's okay to do that. Whereas, you know, if, if you if you smoke, then that's a bad indulgence. If you drink too much coffee, that's a bad indulgence. But I've never heard anybody say that eating too much chocolate is, is a bad thing. Um, you know, it's one of those kind of comforting things that we've always known and always been able to have. No one's ever said, oh, you can't have that. Uh, well, apart from apart from me, obviously, but um, <laughs> it's always been in, always been one of those things where you know, somebody offers you chocolate and it's always that go-to. If you want to show somebody appreciation or you want to show somebody that you care, then the first thing you do is you buy them chocolate, don't you? So it, I think it's one of those very wholesome things that this society will, will never never let go of when they come for chocolate that's going to be the real test <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. never <laughs> well, i mean um, chocolate just... got through both world wars right so well well exactly and actually that that's an important point <laughs> that um from the crimea war chocolate was actually a ration of british mm. soldiers um mm. so there was that sense of well in part it was because it was it was marketed that you could give him a man a chocolate bar a day and he wouldn't need any other food. He would just have that much energy from just chocolate. Um, <laughs> maybe, yeah, so so that, that was part of it. But then I, I guess also this other side of the comfort, the pleasure, you're in this terrible kind of situation, especially in you know, World War I, you're in a trench or something. It's a little bit of home, it's a little bit of, um, something mm. nice in the world when everything else is just hell around you. Just, you. just reminded me, Nathan, I, I don't know if anybody else remembers the um, the Cadbury's Christmas advert um, from a few years ago now. Yes. It was, it was yeah. The, yeah, it was the World War One trenches. The trench was um, on. And mm. it was the football game. Um, but they, the it was... The, that's right. Yeah, so it was based on the on the truth of, in the football game and there was a... Um, <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> I'm just seeing the comment if I just ran 10k on chocolate once. Um, and they hand over a bar of chocolate to who was supposed to be your enemy at the time. Um, so I think it is very strong to remember. And it, it was very homely kind of watching it. It was it was very poignant watching that that advert. But it's one of those adverts where you know it's a good product. They don't need to advertise the product. What they're actually doing is saying that, you know, this is home. This is what this country runs on. <laughs> so um, before, before we kind of get into uh, Bourneville, I wanted to say that I've had a bite of the, the fries cream bar. Uh, I, um, I Hopefully you can see inside. You've got the cream there. So it's it's um, it, there's quite a lot of it in there. I, I would say it's... Um, how would you put it? It's quite a heavy chocolate. 
I think. And the cream is, um, there's a certain mintiness to it. It's not mint, but it kind of tastes like a minty thing. Uh, would I recommend, for historical purposes, I'd recommend hmm. it. Uh, it's, is it, a, it's is it a peppermint thing. one, is it? or? No, this is just the classic. There is a peppermint version. Original. Yeah, I think yes. there's an orange one too, isn't there? Yeah. I don't see it often yeah. though. Mm. No, I, I didn't see any in the shops. No, Fry's has definitely limited what they produce now. That's for sure. They, they don't produce as much or as much of a variety as they used to. So going from the leading chocolate producer to suddenly is quite quiet on our shelves mm. now, which is quite interesting. But, well, I, I wonder if in part you could see... Um... The integration with Cadbury's is part of that because um, I remember watching a stream with um, Thero and AA were talking about um, the drink prime and they were talking about how certain companies will have investments in a number of different kinds of drink, but they're all marketed towards different audiences and they're all kind of doing different things. So none of their products are, although, although they have an investment in multiple companies none of the companies are in direct competition with one another and so when you come to fries and cadbury's because fries does a limited range mm. none of the things that fries does is directly competing with a, a cadbury's kind of product mm. um there's nothing comparable to the dairy milk bar for example but likewise cadbury's isn't doing turkish delight it's fries that are doing that so mm. i wonder if the specialization is part of this um feature of when you have multiple companies under under your investment essentially yeah it, it's almost like the um the the secrecy behind the um recipes for all the different chocolates so, you know we know full well that no no chocolate bar tastes the same so in terms of you know she's having the range you know, so you know fries has the turkish delight but who else actually does turkish delight that, that we're aware of unless it's you know, the local company that's that's very, very small or you know, something along those lines. But each bar, each product is 100% different from the next. Definitely, definitely. Um, and and maybe maybe that's a, a final point to kind of, before we move on to the to Bourneville, is that um, what we're, we're really looking at today is the emergence of chocolate as a, um at a corporation level um before that point it's mainly smaller smaller chocolatiers which are the case and you still have that as a as a an aspect of um european chocolate making right so you you can find local chocolatiers in various places who do very delicious stuff but they're they've been kind of pushed to the margins by these grand corporations that we're looking at so, and and maybe i was thinking about this uh, earlier in terms of um we we often talk about the ills of globalization and the ills of perhaps uh, the development of the corporation or certainly how it's turned out uh, today and its effect on local businesses but is this the gift that britain gave the world in a sense with the industrial revolution certainly when you look at chocolate that's what that's what we did right our and or our ancestors did that um so um what am i trying to say we're, we often talk we are, we're often resistant to uh, maybe narratives of the left of denigrating britain and i'm 100 percent behind behind doing that but perhaps there is a sense in which the british empire <sighs> delivered something in the in the form of the rise of industry the rise of essentially the birthplace of global corporations which maybe isn't such a great thing but what what do you three think of that well for one thing we can uh, we can definitely foist uh, modern corporate uh, governance and uh, and some of the legal structures on uh, the dutch probably so we're not responsible for that one no, i mean um <laughs> I think it's 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 definitely an expansive topic, possibly one to um, to look at in future as a, a stream all its own, because our brand of uh, imperialism is quite unique in some ways. Um, I mean, in other ways, the um, there's a quote about the Roman Empire that they uh, 
they conquered they conquered the known world in self defense, something like that. Uh, and I think there's something that there's a, a similar sort of sentiment uh, that's sort of expressed by an, another quote relating to the British Empire, which is that uh, we seem to have conquered the world in an, uh, a fit of absent mindedness. I like that. I like that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's there's certainly there's certainly an extent to which um, nobody quite intended for things to work out exactly how they did. Um, so, yeah, I think that's something to unpack more more completely elsewhere. Yeah, leading on from that, in terms of the the chocolate aspect of it, you know, when we think of chocolate, we think of this country, whereas we know full well that's that's one hundred percent not where it comes from. And there's, you know, Belgian chocolate is is something to behold. I have to admit, but in terms of you know being an empire, you know this this empire, this country was run on chocolate at one point. It was it was given to our soldiers to keep them going. You know, it's something that actually held this country up, which is not what can be said for a lot of other places. You know, if you, if you go to Belgium and you'd say, oh, what did, what did your chocolate bring to the country? They're not going to reply saying, oh, well, it kept the empire going. You know, that's that's not what they're going to say at all. So I think it's in terms of bringing chocolate into this country, in terms of being a staple of the empire, that's, that's something that we don't even realise. Well, I'd imagine. I know. I know. I, I imagine if uh, there were more leftists on the panel, there would be quite a contentious one regarding, particularly <laughs> sugar and uh, you know slavery and whatnot. And that's not entirely untrue. Um, <laughs> but given that we're not of that persuasion, <laughs> but you're right. I, I think that. It, mm, I mean, I don't know. I suppose that the as a commodity rather than it's just raw ingredients feels very British. I don't know. Does I mean is is Belgian chocolate, does it predate sort of British manufacture, did you say, Birdie? Um, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure. The Belgian chocolate definitely didn't come over here until mm -hmm. way after um, 1870s. You know, it, it came in very, very late as a, as a contender. Um, but it definitely wasn't what we were handing out to, to our own. Um, we were definitely sticking to what we were bringing into the country. Um, and not what uh, other countries are bringing in, if you get what I mean by that. <laughs> yeah, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> Without being uh, too on the nose. <laughs> well, maybe that's a, a, a discussion we can have for another time then, in terms of uh, the pros and cons of mass-produced uh, consumer, uh, consumer products. Um, but let, let's turn to uh, Cadbury's and... and uh, the development of Cadbury's, uh, because I, th I think what's remarkable about the chocolate industry at this time is there were many, there were many industries, there were many mass-produced uh, products, and there was much in the way of developing a, a rich variety and uh, diverse um, consumer market. But what's unique to well, not totally unique, but pr pretty remarkable is that the major families in the chocolate industry really were concerned about the working conditions of their employees and try to try to have a form of capitalism which not only was about producing products most efficiently but actually took into account the well-being of those who are making the chocolate from the highest to the lowest so if we if we look at cadbury's uh, in 1828 I think it was John Cadbury uh, bought over a, a chocolate business, uh, uh, producing the chocolate liquid that we're talking about. And in 1861, uh, the Cadbury, his sons, his Cad the Cadbury brothers, Richard and George, took over the business, which at that time was in Birmingham. Uh, it was around Bridge Street, which uh, if, for those of you who, who know Birmingham, it's one of the main streets within the town. You may have seen it on Peaky Blinders as this kind of hellhole of fire and industry uh, not and debauchery. Uh, not much has changed, to be honest, in, in that regard. Um, and uh, the company was struggling. They had about 10 employees. They were not very profitable. Uh, in part, Richard uh, had been kind of running the company a bit more during that period, and he wasn't a great businessman. He was a good chocolatier. 
but it was George who was the real uh, business brains behind the, the company. And in uh, 1866, they managed to make a big step forward because they finally buy a Van Houten uh, hydraulic press, which allows them to produce a lot more chocolate than they were doing before. And they're then able to start selling to the market. They produce chocolate boxes and Valentine's Day boxes for the first time. And uh, they managed to gain some success from that point. Things take a turn in 1878. They've grown the business quite substantially from 10 employees to several hundred now. And the Bridge Street factory is not going to, to be, it's not enough room for them, essentially. Um, and then at, at the same time, uh, as George Cadbury um, and, and Richard, they were both, as we've been alluding to, very devout Quakers. Uh, and part of the, part of their Quaker beliefs, as George would put it, is seeing in every individual that they are equal in the eyes of God, that they have a certain dignity. And the surroundings of uh, Birmingham, in their view, were not conducive to the dignity of the of their workers. Uh, I think George said, how could you expect a man to grow in a place where a rose couldn't grow? Right, in the middle of a city. Um, and so they, they felt that they needed to move to the countryside, both to accommodate their larger workforce and to, well, the, to, to benefit uh, those working for them. So in 1878, they made the move to the Bornbrook estate, uh, later to be called Bourneville, and I'll, I'll try and bring up some images now. Uh, the area is still pretty much what it would have looked like at that time. Uh, they've managed to keep it uh, pretty much intact. This was a rather large estate uh, where they built the factory, and um, they made sure that uh, it was there were several houses for the uh, the workers there. I, I think when they they built it initially, there was about 300 houses, mostly for foremen. Uh, there was lots of green spaces as well. The They provided multiple uh, centers for activities. So, for example, there were cricket pitches, football pitches, tennis courts. Uh, there, was pub there was schools, uh, both for children and for adults in terms of arts and crafts, basic arithmetic, English literature. Uh, there was uh, events such as May Day dances and Christmas festivities and, and so on. There was a swimming pool. He provided uh, George Cadbury and Richard Cadbury, they provided all of this with their own money. They also provided to the workers' needs. So things such as uh, um, there was a doctor and a dentist free of charge for all uh, members of the, of the uh, factory. There was a pension, one of the first pensions in, in England. There was a living wage, essentially, for, for them. So it wasn't just uh, the minimum that they could be paid, but actually something that they could have a little bit left over to spend on themselves and look after themselves. Uh, there was security for sickness as well. So if you're sick, you don't just not get any income. You actually have some kind of income coming in, so you sick pay. These are all things we kind of take for granted now but this was quite revolutionary for the time. And uh, this was all kind of brought together by George and Richard themselves. They were not doing all of this from afar, uh, kind of in their ivory towers. They very much got involved in the factory itself. Um, George would lead at the beginning of every day a service of worship. There would be a Bible reading, and then they would sing a hymn together before going off into the, the rest of the factory. They were well known to actually get to know the, the employees uh, very personally and talk to them and kind of ask about their interests and so on, help them in various ways. George taught at the local school uh, quite regularly. They would fix pipes if they were leaking and, and so on. And uh, we'll, we'll touch on maybe a bit more of, of their personality and character in, in as we go on but maybe this is probably the biggest testament to to both of them is that when george died uh, in the early 20th century 16,000 people 
attended his funeral, which I think um, in the modern day, that's uh, quite astounding and says something about the character and the effect they had on, on the people that worked for them. Yeah, I do get a very strong sense, and I've thought about this uh, often before, that we do almost get a, a glimpse into what was a possible alternative view, uh, route to industrialization or a po mm. possible alternate, al alternate way of doing uh, industrial uh, economics, basically, because it does come across as a lot more um, traditionally aristocratic, or perhaps you could even say uh, this is perhaps a little bit more content contentious and carries more um, stigma, I suppose, but um, going by someone like uh, George Fitzhugh uh, when he's writing the sociology for the South, uh, it comes across as something approaching like plantation conditions where there are provisions made for uh, for the slaves that, that sort of come across to, to some extent in what's being provided here, you know, like providing for their uh, physical well-being, making sure that they're okay uh, if they are uh, injured and, and can't work, making sure that they're okay in their old age and you know, all sorts of things that give like a full full spectrum of care towards them, rather than just treating them as a uh, an interchangeable uh, unit of human capital. Hmm. I think going on from as as you say, Rupert, in terms of having a full spectrum of care, I mean, it's been proven throughout history that if you treat your workers well, they will work harder. You know, and I think that had a, a very key point into how Bourneville became so massive. You know, it wasn't just a case of they did all this for their workers, but because they did this, you know, their workers gave them back, a, if not double, you know, they became a massive industry. And not only that, they were, you know, the pillar of, of today's workforce in, in terms of, you know, we've got uh, statutory sick pay um, and health care and uh my brain is just not working anymore. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of things that they provided that we, we still have in today's uh, workforce system. Well, that, that's why I would say that it's, it's kind of a more interesting avenue. Uh, and mm. I put more stock on this compared to, I can't remember if it was the fries or the round trees that also had the same kind of disposition. But instead of making those provisions themselves to the same degree, they were instead lobbying government to do it on, on their behalf, essentially. And that's kind of more what we have now. Whereas obviously yeah. in the Bourneville case, uh, things are much more um, carefully crafted and, like I said, aristocratic in nature. Because you almost you almost get the sense that the um, the Cadburys are aristocrats of the older sort, um, where they are kind of like existing on this giant estate, which has which has like a cumulative output, um, but it's it, it's something that they are actively involved in personally, and they oversee it as their own little little fife. Yeah, I also see it as a as a community in terms of Bourneville knew that if they had their own community, they would they could um, support each other. Whereas, as, as you say, Cadbury is kind of, yes, they were successful, but even now I feel like they do tend to look down on their peers rather than, you know, see them eye to eye, which does make a, a massive difference, I think. It actually reminds me of um just like Josiah Wedgwood. He had something very, very similar uh, actually, in the future, maybe like the Staffordshire potteries would be interesting to look at because they. He, yeah, I don't know if this was something that was a Christian phenomenon at the time, but yeah, looking after your workers, he had a sort of own little village, really. And uh, just, just a bit like Bourneville and Cadbury's, I guess Spode was always seen as the slightly lesser of the two, I guess. Um, but it helped it helped him kind of rocket his prestige, uh, having, having all these wonderful conditions and like a little model village where everybody lived and whatnot really took care of them. It's quite interesting. Well, as someone mentioned in the comments, um, that it wasn't perhaps entirely altruistic in a sense. Well, no, not, that's the wrong way of phrasing it, but it, it wasn't entirely one sided in terms of uh, in terms of arrangement, because the expectation as as ardent moralists themselves was that it would uh, inculcate a certain amount of morality into the workers. Uh, and so I'm sure if, if it hadn't had that kind of effect and they'd, uh, you know, been uh, you know, debauched and um, completely wayward then uh, perhaps they wouldn't have they wouldn't have been quite so keen to to keep up the project but um in that way it seems pretty reminiscent of um henry ford's project as well because he had a similar thing in mind a similar goal in mind of, mm. uh, of trying to encourage morality in his workers very much so and i i think when 
when uh, with Edward Cadbury, who was the son of George in the early 20th century, he summed up the vision of Cadbury's as producing quality chocolate and benefiting or, or the welfare of our of our employees on a spiritual, moral, and physical level. Um, just th just think about that spiritual for a second. Uh, thinking of the spiritual welfare of your worker is. Gosh, quite you'd a... never hear that today, would you? That's absolutely a foreign notion. It's beautiful though, and very. Mm -hmm touching in a way well and and when uh so uh part of that morality for example was they were quite um hard but fair on them so if they uh what it, so they were paid in terms of piecework rather than uh timed work so it's not how long you work it's actually what you produce you will be paid um if you make mistakes along the way you get deductions from your pay but if you do exceptional work you get various bonuses uh, part of the morality, too, was a very strict division between men and women within the workplace. There were certain areas that men were not allowed in at all within the community um, uh, because most of the, well, all the female employees were also single women because George Cadbury believed a married woman's place is not at work but in the home. But when they left, every every single woman who's going to go and get married, they would have a one-to-one -one conversation with George uh, an exit interview, you might say, but considering this, he would give spiritual and moral advice for the married life. Um, he would give them all a Bible and a lovely flower to leave. So, oh, uh, that's so touching. Oh, sweetie. The only word that's coming into my head right now is based. <laughs> I thought you were going to say simp, actually, Bertie. But... <laughs> Wait, I'm about to eat. Simp, <laughs> um, maybe. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, but but uh, but I think um, that that sort of spirit and, and and also as well I should say that they had uh, an absolute ban on alcohol within the community as well. So there was no alcohol drinking as you might expect um, within it. But there was plenty of recreational activities that people could do, um, and so it was all about cultivating these things. I think I think there's a number of reasons that we've kind of touched on it. It might be helpful just to to pass them out clearly. So we've mentioned the Christian aspect of it. And certainly during this period, you find um, a number of uh, Christian uh, businessmen and uh, lords as well, who are motivated by an almost, well, a millenarian expectation, the idea that Christ could come back tomorrow and you will be held account for what you've been doing. So what have you been doing? There's almost this sense of, um, I must do these things. And this is actually the normal thing to do. This is the right thing to do. It's not exceptional. So when uh, George Cadbury was kind of asked in later life, if he would um, join the, the Privy Council for what he's been doing, and he said, well, what I've been doing is not exceptional. Uh, it, sh it should be the norm, not the, not the something that's elevated above everything else. So I think that's, that's one driving part of it. Uh, we've touched also on the moral aspect in terms of benefiting workers um, in their own in their own right. And I wanted to give a little um, just read from a an article some accounts of how workers actually were treated at the factory because they're quite illuminating. And um, if I, if I can find the right page, that would be helpful. Um, sorry about this. So yes, um, we have, I, I'll just read a couple of paragraphs and that might give you a sense of how people were treated by the Cadburys. So, um, sorry. Alice Bond came to Bourneville in 1885 to work in the card box department. Mr. George impressed her with his personal interest in everything concerning the work people, not only for their physical, but for their spiritual welfare. Her feelings for Mr. Richard Cadbury were almost embarrassingly intense. My heart went out to him at once. His commanding presence and his beautiful face fit in perfectly with my ideal of what a man of God should be. She and her friends also enjoyed the social life at Bourneville. I remember our first attempt for a summer party. We had a maypole fixed in the small playground. 
The 24 juniors looked so sweet in their white dresses and coloured ribbons, which the firm kindly provided. Such scenes of revelry and fun in such a perfect setting. Fanny Price, also a peace worker, cherished Bourneville's rural surroundings. When she moved from Bridge Street to Bourneville, the brightness and spaciousness of the works delighted her. We all loved the country. It was such a change from town. And sometimes we would hurry over our dinner in order to go out as soon as we could to explore the field and lanes. Bourneville men were no less enthusiastic. John Fryer began working in the moulding department in 1879, later serving as a foreman from 1894 to 1927. Kindly treated by George and Richard, at his interview he reported, it was also different from the way the average small boy thought of an employer of labour. Fryer, a sporting man, prized the games and recreation at Bourneville. His passion for cricket did not lessen his pride in taking part in the social and educational schemes of the firm. The roasting cocoa, he wrote, means the welfare of the works and of the district and of the people. It also meant the welfare of William Davenport, who became head of the London office. When Davenport left his job at Birmingham Bank to work at Bourneville in 1885, he was struck by the contrast between them. Immediately at home there, he ascribed his good fortune to the sense of touch with my principles. Notwithstanding his own ambition, he was inspired by Cadbury's personal interest in him and his progress. They somehow conveyed the idea that their purpose was to do something for one, rather than to get the last ounce in the way of work. I think they generally did get the fullest in service, but they attracted it. They did not force it. So I, I think you can kind of see that the Cadburys themselves um, very much threw themselves into their workforce and really cared for their um, employees. And this was part of their approach to Im improve their lives on a in terms of a moral level. Um, and I, I would add to that, well, I'll, I'll come back around. I'll, I'll come in, Birdie. Come in. And... No, I, I just wanted to touch on uh, the terms of when they said attracted it. Um, you know, they they attracted the workforce, which is massive these days. If if people want to work for you, then you've already ticked so many boxes. So you know, if, if everybody else um, in the surrounding areas is seeing how well these people are being treated. It's going to really help people set up their, their lives. So if you want to work for this company, then that is something that you just don't see very often now. So that was in itself a, a groundbreaking achievement. Well, no, I, I think this ties in with something that um, John Ruskin argued in Unto the Last. Uh, Ruskin, uh, and, and it's interesting because Cadbury... Uh, George Cadbury built uh, Ruskin Hall in Bourneville uh, for the study of arts and crafts. So he was, it seems like he was influenced by Ruskin. And uh, for Ruskin, um, he makes this argument about how can you get the best efficiency in your organization? You can try to force it, but it's not going to make a, a person work any harder than they have to, to avoid being punished. Whereas if by your character, your leadership, and a care for the, the worker, which isn't primarily aimed at economic gain, so actually just keep caring for them, they will be um, moved in the will, in the affections, as he says, which is the driving force of all human activity, very Carlyle in this idea, which in mm. turn is uh, influenced by Thomas Chalmers, who I, I did a stream on many years ago this idea that as much as you can try and force somebody to do something actually if you motivate them to do it of their own will through love then you they'll actually work much harder of their own accord and with much joy and so mm -hmm. in in so doing you get a far more efficient and more productive company than if you try to force it into place yeah i don't want to throw in a curveball but <laughs> It all sounds great, but in terms of everything being a bit too 
perfect. You know, people, they're getting all this care, they're getting their wages, they're being looked after. There are going to be some who fall out of line. Now, we've not heard of any situations of this. Now, I'm sure there were means in place to enforce the rules. Um, I'm just interested if anyone knows what they were, because, you know, everything does seem a bit too good to be true, if that makes sense. So, yes, it's lovely. Yes, we know they look after them. They, you know, if, if you don't do your work, you do get your wages docked sort of thing. But that's the same with any job. You know, I'm, I'm what I want to know is the ones who don't do the work properly. You know, they're just there because they're getting a pension, they're getting health care, they're getting a roof over their heads. You know, what, what actually happened? Because they had so many working for them. I... Maybe it's just me, <laughs> me being uh, <laughs> depressing about the subject, but I can't possibly believe that every single person there was behaving themselves to the point of doing exceptional work. Does does that make any sense? Well, uh, one thing that did come to mind is that it's potentially, uh, to some extent, time limited and or limited by the extent to which the competition is uh, nowhere near as generous. So insofar as everybody is providing the same because it's legally mandated, then suddenly that becomes something that they can't differentiate themselves on, on anymore. It becomes uh, well less, less prestigious, uh, a, a job to work at. So, so there's that. Uh, and perhaps just the extent to which uh, people would have a knowledge of what, uh, what other opportunities there were and how much worse they were by comparison. So coming from a different industry and seeing how bad it was there, um, mm -hmm. then, you know, going to Cadbury and, uh, and being treated much better. You know, yeah, I think what, what comes to mind as well is they must have been quite strict on who they actually let into the factories. Um, you know, because obviously with the age restriction and having to be single if you're a woman, etc. And so that does jump to mind when actually allowing people to to work for them. I can only think that yes, hundreds of hundreds, if not thousands, of people wanted to work for them, but they were very specific in who they actually let through the gates. Yeah, and presumably they were selecting for people who already had uh, some fairly strong religious convictions that would uh, that mm -hmm. would drive them to be. You know, of good of good character from their from their core as well as um, just in terms of being able to encourage good behaviors in them by incentives. Yeah, because in, in in a way, it's not just uh, inviting them in to be part of the workforce. You are inviting them into your own community as such. You know, you all live together, not just work together. So I suppose they were looking for for characters who would fit well into the whole picture and not just the workforce. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that's right, and um, I, I think as well, the one aspect we haven't really touched on is they did have um, a degree of um, worker input into how things were being run as well. So initially, I think it's in 1903, they have a suggestions box installed. Um, and in time, this kind of becomes the genesis of uh, the working councils. So you would have various representatives from the shop floor, from management, and so on. And they were largely responsible for running uh, the factory and for the welfare of the factory. So you have two things there, then. You have uh, input in how your, like the nature of your job and getting some ownership in that, but also self-policing. So it's in the interests of the employees to keep everybody in line as well, not just the management, uh, because they have buy-in to what's taking place at Cadbury's. And I, I think that was quite an Im important aspect of it, that it, George and Richard Cadbury very much didn't want it to become um, an, a, just an, a, a dictatorship, I think is how they would have seen it. They didn't want it to be like that. They wanted to lead they, and they were very much leading it, um, but with input from everybody who's working in the company. And yeah, and I mean, you get a lot of companies like that now who who have various uh, initiatives to try and try and have that sort of buy-in from the employees. Yeah, I think that's kind of what makes this whole sort of situation seem a bit far-fetched to us nowadays. Because as you say, we have that quite a lot in companies now, where the employees have 
an input on how the company is run or how things are are done. Um, so actually knowing that they not manage to keep control of, of their employees, but manage to have a system where everybody got along, not only in the workplace, but because they lived together and they all worked together in terms of they were happy to do that. They were happy to to work under a name, but knowing that they were protected in, in a way from any outside force that could could come crashing down was is something to behold in you know today's today's society because it is very rare to see. Although to put a bit of an, another downer on, uh, <laughs> on the whole idea, I mean, uh, it probably also is worth bearing in mind that there's a good chance that they were working with uh, significantly better human capital, just as a standard. You know, people people back then were just a bit different, um, and and yeah. uh, I would not necessarily say we've uh, moved in a positive direction. So perhaps yeah, just except taking... at Black Horse's company, except at his. Yeah, <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> But you know, more, more to the point yeah. that you could perhaps just take take any any random person off the street and they'd be of a of a better quality than you could expect from the average person nowadays. Yeah, I think it's important to remember as well that back then work was everything. You know, you literally could not live if you didn't work, and by that I mean you were on the streets. Um, so your work was your life. So if you weren't happy at work, then you weren't really living. Well, and, and to the to the point that you were raising before birdie about what kind of punishments lady of shallot has said that if people consistently were not working you know within the rules of gadbury they lost their house so it was a it was a major deal you you didn't you couldn't just kind of keep going and have various tribunals to get through it all the time there was a, a real cost to to not buying into it so that that was that's the the other side of it whereas today people could fall back on welfare and so on um so so that kind of uh removes the necessity of buying in a sense i i, I think there's a there's another point uh, that i wanted to kind of draw in here as well and uh rupert you made the point earlier about how today a lot of the if, if people were looking for better working conditions they primarily uh lobby the government or corporations lobby the government for various things to happen. And certainly during the Victorian era, you do have uh, various socialist groups who are, uh, and actors, uh, I think of Charles Kingsley, for example, who was pushing in that direction. You then have on the other side, um, somebody like Thomas Chalmers, who was a huge figure in the Scottish context, who said, no, it's not actually the, the social conditions, it's the moral fiber of the people, which is the problem. And so if we raise the ideals of the people, if we see transformation of them, then we will achieve uh, a great situation. And actually, if we try social reforms, they'll just become dependent upon them. So you could see him as a kind of proto-libertarian argument being made by him. George Cadbury tried to take a certain middle ground in that regard, because on the one hand, he very much says, look, if you want to raise the people, you need to spiritually, morally, physically improve them. On the other hand, he, his experiences of teaching in inner city Birmingham said to it kind of made him think, well, it's almost impossible for somebody to grow within this environment, that within these slums, there's no hope of this person spiritually growing in the way that we would want them to either because they're too poor so they, they're not going to be able to concentrate on this sort of thing they're just trying to scrape a meal each day or because of the vices that are open to them such as the local uh um ale house as he in his view would be the the, the main thing that they would go to so in his view part of the creation of bourneville is providing a context in which his workforce would be open to moral reform. Uh, so so it's he's taking a combination of the two points of view and saying it's not just moral reform, it's not just uh, the environmental factors that need to be changed. In, with capitalist industries, you can do both and actually have a really powerful, um, a powerful form of addressing these situations. 
yeah it's like um working on a on a new on like a fresh canvas uh, and i it sort of almost brings to mind the um the monastery system or the, the like the abbey system uh, as it existed earlier on where sort of fairly desolate bits of land would be given over to the church uh, and they would they would be able to uh pursue moral objectives alongside industry um in that in that context and then uh, something something could grow around them you know like uh, a village could sort of grow grow around them on the uh like after they've having got the got the foundations right um again on that kind of like blank blank canvas where they weren't trying to work inside the confines of uh, of the, the fallen world as they might have, as they might have seen it so so there is a um to a degree the retreat from uh normal life allows for the growth of a new kind of life i guess in the monastic context would you see that as the the kind of thrust here there is that there is that element and i think that's a that's a commonality but i think it's also quite significant to not overlook the uh the aspect where it's being very much directed and that's why i emphasized the aristocratic mm. quality earlier because i do think it is um something that is contingent on the the vision of either a man or men who are very much uh, in tune with one another on what the what the requirements are and they can direct it personally and uh, and have a vision which they see from from end to end you know they're not they're not trying mm. to determine things by um by some kind of elective body or or by committee or, or whatever they're acting more as a man of action and uh, and building it themselves it's the word that kept coming up in the scholarship is paternal yeah. They, they they see it in a paternalistic way and I would I would suggest somebody like Lord Shaftesbury or John Ruskin himself actually they all shared that kind of thrust that um we're going to do something and make a difference and we will build something to achieve that um it's, sorry go ahead Rupert it's yeah it's a return to a more uh, patrimonial style as well in another way it's, it's it's almost like um building any kind of like older aristocratic estate in some sense but but doing so on a uh, on a scale that is that is much greater in terms of human capital than than we would usually associate again it's like it's like building like the the older styles of building a building a plantation but you're doing it with with industry uh we, we, you know with newer industries and uh and free labor well no, i think and I'll, I'll let you come in in a second birdie but i i, th I think um we we've, we've spoken a bit about this before and i know you've written on it rupert uh the drive within uh Western men to to have their own kingdoms essentially, or to build something of their own, to have their own domain, and it seems in the modern world that's increasingly being frustrated or or ground down or channeled into very uh, shallow ciphers. Whereas in this period, you you have through industrialization a space for such men to actually build a vision, um, their own visions, their own creations. But do so in a way which is, in, I guess, informed by their their Christianity, able to uh, enrich their fellow man in a way that um, perhaps, well, it, I, it was a it was a unique circumstance and combination. I guess is what I'm saying. Well, I, I would say perhaps for for most of history, it's not all that unique. Um, it's just mm. that it was perhaps one of the last gasps of that that kind of. Uh possibility that like that that kind of world that you could still uh build uh, and that that way in which you could still sort of like construct something almost out of nothing um and and like really own it whereas uh ever since a lot of those avenues have been closed off to most people most definitely uh birdie did you want to come in yeah i just wanted to add on the paternal um aspect of it so in terms of you know they're saying they're very much paternal uh leaders that to me kind of jumped in when you were saying earlier nathan about them giving the the single women if they were going off to get married you know the, the the main thing that they would do is you know give them advice and talk to them before they left and basically telling them that it was going to be okay um but not only that they it, the all the workforce looked up to both of them um with the same sort of respect that you would give your parents you know so you you knew they were authoritative figures but in a way, you also knew they were there to look after you. You know, they knew what they were doing. They had the knowledge that you instantly trusted because they had that paternal sort of instinct towards their whole workforce, which I think is something that's 
very very strong in terms of being able to keep everybody under one roof as it were as a as a big family in terms of you know rather than having your workforce they were essentially their family yeah and, and that's that's pretty explicitly how it was originally conceived and it's only sort of later that that's been obfuscated the that kind of power um and, and the the patrimonial way of uh, of viewing things was was very explicitly seen in terms of like a father uh, father and and servants or father and, and children kind of relationship obviously when you're talking about employees then it's more of like a, a servant and, and like a member of the household um in a um aristocratic retinue kind of kind of sense as we would associate it like a, uh, yeah well yeah a servant basically but um but yeah i mean they they are they are still the the single father figure to to everyone that comes beneath them blood blood relative or not well, it, yeah, exactly. And you, you have in the early modern, well, in medieval and early modern, uh, the father is the governor of his family and his household. And then at the same time, this this gets flipped around, right? So the king is the father of the nation, essentially. Yeah, exactly. That's that's where yeah. I was, the other place I was going to go is, is it, you can scale this up or down basically as much as you like, because when you get to the nation level, the, the king is the is, is that kind of figure for uh, for the entire nation. And uh, again, mm. a lot of writers early on in uh, in the life of political science or modern political science, I suppose, were were, were writing explicitly in these terms uh, as the the powers of a father, um, or like a patriarch, being explicitly analogous or even an extension of those of the the king over the uh, over the realm. They are his properties; it's his patrimony, and. Uh, to that extent, everybody, everybody in the nation or on his on his property is either you know like a um, a child or a servant or have, has that kind of like father father servant father son kind of relationship. Yeah, and no, I, I think that's really um, powerful in the sense that it's it's a set of personal relations that it's being framed through. So a father is um, a descendant of a, a family already. He belongs in a tradition that predates himself. And then his role is to sustain, maintain, and see the family survive into the next generation. So you have this connection with the past, present, and future. You have certain obligations, responsibilities to particular people, your children, your spouse, et cetera, et cetera, in a way that modern political governance, the, uh, the removal of the idea of the father, for example, we're a, it's a bunch of abstract relations uh, rather than personal relations. It's a um, presentist interpretation of of government and the citizen, as opposed to a one that spans through time. Uh, Birdie. No, I was just going to say that um, the paternal figure. So it's such as uh, George but have a level of respect that some you know would not have towards certain members of the government today you know that you there is a level of respect that can be earned and he managed to earn it in a way before even meeting his employees you know they already had respect for him for what he'd already produced what he'd already shown could be done and was successful in doing that. So already he had that that correct level of respect to be able to have that sort of miniature patriarchal society within his own his own miniature uh, village, as it were. So th this is actually a picture of George, and uh, I, I think you can see there's a there's a certain fire and life in his eyes, uh, <laughs> but he does also have a very fatherly uh, aspect, and that. I, I can't remember where I read this, but I'm sure I've read that some of the employees called him Father George, actually, which puts it even more on the mm. uh, it's on the nail even more. Um, so, so I, I I do think that this is right that the the kind of father aspect of it is important, uh, and that he had a real devotion to his employees so much so that he turned down a government office several times because he thought, no, I've got a responsibility to these people. And I could do my best serving them rather than, uh, you know, working in in Westminster or whatever. Um, 
go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, I feel like he had the attitude of you know, he could do more on the lower level. So rather than sitting mm. up in the high chair and, and looking down on people, he believed and achieved that he could help them being eye level with them. So if he was actually working with the working class, he knew that he could help them instead of being in government and sitting there. And rather than just talking about it, he was, as we said earlier, a man of action and actually stuck by his word. Very much so. Very much so. I, I um, I, I guess uh, I, I wanted to to kind of read a little section from um, his son's book. Uh, his son did a, a book called Experiments in Industrial Organization, which I think um, addresses some of what we've been talking about. And it gets very much to the heart of, of George's vision. And uh, this comes from the preface of, of the book. Um, with this frame of mind, we cannot but feel a certain sympathy. In businesses managed by a single proprietor, it is often true that the worry of getting trade, on top of the other worry of looking after the plant, is so harassing and engrossing that the employer has simply no energy to spare for anything else. But as it, the undertaking increases in scale, it ceases to be possible to keep everything under one man's guidance. And with specialization of responsibility, if not before, comes an opportunity to take stock of the situation. And what the business world is now realizing is that, whether they desire it or no, the labor side of a big industrial concern calls for a large and continuous expenditure of brain power on the part of somebody. It cannot be left to subordinates, very paternalistic. It must be made the main concern of one of the heads of the business. And even then, there will be large questions of policy which will need to be anxiously and laboriously considered by the whole board. We have already had enough experience in this matter to be able to say that in the direction and regulation of labour, there are two lines of policy to be avoided. One is that which devises beneficent arrangements with the intention of lessening the workman's independence. With the purpose, for example, so to attach the workman by material ties to the concern that employs him that he will no longer care about a trade union. Such a policy may possibly be sometimes justifiable, and it may be possibly sometimes succeed. But broadly speaking, it is incompatible with the democratic temper of the age, and it is almost certain to break down. The other policy is that which fixes its attention on the efficiency of the workman as a living tool and disregards every other part of his individuality. Bonus or premium plans which are designed to extract every ounce of effort out of a man. Schemes of scientific division of labor which are intended to reduce work to the repetition of a few simple movements. These may indeed succeed for the time and even bring the work people larger earnings but they are bound to awaken resentment. For in the long run, awkward as the fact is from a purely business point of view, human beings will insist on being treated as human beings and not as imperfect machines. It is for businessmen to say how far the methods set forth in this book are suitable for imitation in other manufacturing establishments. Businesses differ greatly from one another in the type of labor they employ. Feasible or desire with one type may be impracticable or undesirable with another. But it will be apparent that the measures here described proceed from principles the very opposite to those above mentioned. They respect the industrial independence of the work people. They treat them not as mere work people, but as citizens with their own human hopes and aspirations and their own part to play in the life of a democratic nation. Everyone who is acquainted at all intimately with the Bourneville works and with those who direct them knows full well that the mainspring of their policy has been a sense of social duty. No political partisanship should blind even the severest, severest of critics to this primary fact. And I feel bound to say this more emphatically because on certain important political issues of the day, I find myself in an opposite camp. 
But though the ultimate motive has not been business expediency, and much of the action here narrated has evidently been direct outcome of considerations of a quite different nature, it is the belief of the firm that, taken as a whole, their policy has distinctly paid. And this aspect of the matter, which particularly interests me as Dean of a Faculty of Commerce, concerned with the training of young businessmen, it has paid in two ways. For first, I see no reason why we should not be quite frank in the matter. It has been a splendid advertisement. Instead of cynically poo-pooing it for that reason, I think this is a particularly encouraging fact and highly creditable to human nature. It shows there is such a thing as a consumer's conscience. The whole essence of the Consumers League work in America and of the white lists of the Christian social, social Union in this country is to make it good business to be known to manufacture under satisfactory working conditions. And with increasing publicity and in, an increasing fellow feeling among all classes, I expect that this is going to be the case more and more. And secondly, it has reduced the expenses of manufacture. An atmosphere of goodwill in a shop makes every operation run more smoothly, and the better the work and the mental and physical powers of the operatives are adjusted to one another, the less there is of lost time and of a score of those other occasions of expense which do so much to swell general charges. Any thoughts on uh, Edward's uh, speech there? I mean, everything kind of adds up, really, doesn't it? And from what we know, fact-wise, um, in terms of what George did, it then becomes very apparent through his his own son's words. Um, I picked up on a couple of things. Um, I think uh, I might have got this slightly wrong, but um, treat them not as mere workmen, but as citizens. Um, I might have got a couple of words wrong there, but in terms of treating your workforce as as citizens, again, links into what, what we've been saying and that level of respect. Um, and there's such a thing as a consumer's conscience. Absolutely. I mean, that that's apparent um, in, in today's society, let alone back then. So actually noticing that it was a thing um, back then would definitely have helped with the whole scheme in itself. It did strike me though that uh, we've we've probably gone on a on a wrong path somewhere by thinking that uh, we can sort of impose these things widely via via something like policy, um, whether that be company policy or uh, or government policy. Uh, I think the result is basically the same, um, especially because once you put these kinds of things in writing and you make it uh, established everywhere, then uh, it just becomes something that's very easily exploitable and uh, furthermore taken for granted. So perhaps there's some degree to which it could only ever have been a temporary phenomenon um, as they as they experienced it, although we might we might point to other advantages of a kind of more paternalistic way of doing business, um, you know, with like a single director and uh, uh, somebody to, you know, like a, a, a proper captain at the helm, that kind of thing. But um, yeah, this idea of uh, respecting the um, the employees as as citizens, as you put Bertie, as um, perhaps not something that can be th that is too sustainable for too long uh, because people will find a way to exploit it and uh, and you'll get all the hangers on sort of trying to figure out how to best get as much as they can out of the system yeah absolutely and to completely agree with you on a point you've actually made earlier rupert in terms of the the actual mentality of, of people now is a hundred percent different to, to what it was back then you know if you had somebody getting into that job nowadays as, as you say it would be exploited almost instantly they'd find something wrong with the system and it just wouldn't work which is a massive shame in itself because i think there are enough of us to know that, that this system did work um, and you know we'd want it to work again but in reality you know it's, it is actually a, a rare phenomenon now to to work again and i think the only way it would work and has done is in a very small group or a small community um it would nowhere near work on on the scale that he managed to get it to uh, back then so when i say small i mean you know a workforce of maybe 10 to 15 people not 1500 people 
It's it's interesting because um, Black Horse makes the comment that Elon Musk has mastered this, and I, I think he means the kind of respect of his organization, and certainly at Tesla, having people who work for him, and the operation is totally shaped by him. Twitter, we've seen that initially maybe he had certain controls, then it seemed to kind of the bureaucracy fought back, and now we're in this weird space where uh, there's all these weird changes taking place, um, but. But it does seem that it there's a possibility of if if a figure like him or a figure like a George Cadbury was able to really take the helm of a, an organization, um, there's certain um, there's a certain way that they could go uh, with that organization today, and perhaps the what's incumbent is to try and well uh, sorry go ahead Bertie. No, I was just going to say in terms of. Elon's kind of got it there, but I would say it was a different level of respect, so a different type of respect. So the kind of respect that Elon has is from people who have worked with him for years um, and they know how he works and they've become friends. So, you know, they work shoulder and shoulder. Um, whereas the kind of respect that, that George had was a respect that was very new. You know, people had respect for him before they'd known him, before they'd worked with him. So, yes, there are similarities there, but I do think that the actual type of respect that each of them have has caused some very different types of, of working in terms of their, their regimes. And you know, as we said earlier, that we don't actually think is, is going to work again, um, because in reality, you know, the way that Elon's done it is because he's known these people for years. You know, he's become friends with his employers rather than being that paternal figure that, that we saw in George. Well, no, I, I would just add to that. I think the the current system prevents uh, figures from really implementing their moral vision in their business life. If you look at something like the Equalities Act, for example, you would be sued if you discriminated on the basis of religion, right? Um, but for somebody like George Cadbury, it's his life. He, he can do no other than implement his religion and have a, a Christian service at the beginning of work. And so if, if you were to, and you, you can't separate that from all the other parts, like the pension schemes and so on, because it's that it's that spiritual vision which is driving the rest of it. Yeah. And so until you are able to eliminate certain legal things in the system, remove them in various ways, you're not going to be able to have... Um, businessmen taking the helm and implementing their visions in mm -hmm. their work for the betterment of their of their um of the of their workers if, yeah. if they were so inclined because i don't think there's a great many businessmen who would think that way today either for, no for absolutely like <laughs> and right. i think it's important to remember that you know back in george's day the vast majority had the same um views the same opinions the same religions so it was in a way easy to do that because he knew that there were enough people to be able to work for him and have that same level of respect because they all shared the same view on things whereas now as we know things are very divided and there's a lot of legal systems involved and it's very easy to offend somebody so because of that alone you know you can't have the vast majority of people having the same view without someone being against it or another group being against it. So you have to kind of be able to get a balance there somehow. And that balance has become incredibly difficult to get in a, in a very large number of people. So we're, we're coming towards the end of the stream. So I wanted to give everybody an opportunity for any final or closing comments. And uh, we've, we've not heard from uh, daughter of Albion for a while, so I wanted to give you the first chance to, uh, <laughs> to, to, to round out the discussion. I admit, I popped downstairs just to put the heating back on because it's getting a bit chilly. <laughs> um, oh, fair enough. <laughs> But no, lovely rounding points. The only thing I was going to add is um, in, in regards to what, uh, whether or not we could see the same uh, dynamic from a, an employer today is I, I also wonder about the attitude of people today, whether we'd be as conducive and receptive to it now as they were then. But other than that, I mean, rounding up points. Uh, I just I, I wonder how many how many chocolates and sweets you managed to get through, Nathan, of your personal collection there on the fly. 
Did you manage I, to get through any of them? <laughs> just I've, the I've only had one bite of the, the cream. Just so one I'm going bite. to have a I'm gonna have a dairy milk in the next uh, couple of summer You must be uh, itching to uh rip open the package. <laughs> so yes. I, I'm toasting George. Here's to George Cadbury. He sounds like a uh, lovely gentleman, I must say. Yeah, quite the specimen. Mm -hmm. All right. mm. so, somebody to look up to, for sure. I agree, I quite agree. But that was all we're at, right? <laughs> awesome, awesome. Uh Rupert. Well, I'm to, so to to answer some of the uh discussion going on in the chat I, I am quite optimistic about the possibility of bringing back this uh this attitude um bringing back george as it were um and i think a big part of it is just sort of the mindset that we have towards um things like being able to build the kind of um power that is that is sort of necessary to exercise that kind of control obviously the, the, there's there's the very important component of uh of having the the moral grounding to make best use to uh, make best use of it but um, we also have to know, even if we have that, how do we build that power in the first place? And how do we actually ensure that we're not just going to have some other authority sitting on our shoulder, uh, trying to make sure that we act in a, in a particular way that is uh, conducive to their interests rather than what we want to do? And I think that's, that, that is quite possible. We just need to sort of be able to properly appraise the situation and understand um, the surroundings and understand what to pursue. So to that end, it's something that I'll continue to... Uh, to be writing on and continue to try and work on. I sort of laid a bit of foundation in the um, the two articles that you may have read about mm -hmm. uh, the, the main one being questing for Imperium, uh, as, as I called it at the time, uh, the, the desire to build Imperium. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, continuing to continuing to expand, expand on that idea and build it out into something, something like a, uh, a handbook for how to develop aristocratic tendencies and build your estate and build your Imperium is, uh, is definitely something worth, worth pursuing. So uh, yeah, keep an eye out, and hopefully I'll have something to share. Well, no, I'd definitely recommend those uh, that article that you you were plugging there uh, for that very reason. And also, we, we still need to do, to organise this, but in a month or so, we will be doing a stream on kind of restorations and and so on, which might tie into some of this discussion. So uh, that's one to look out for. And um, Birdie, your final thoughts. Um, lovely stream, by the way. Uh, thank you for having me on. But no, I think Rupert August, uh, you really hit the nail on the head there. Um, I think we can do it. We can go back to to uh, George's master plan, should we say. As somebody commented, return to George. Um, <laughs> I, I think it can be done um, at the moment. Yes, we are on, on a smaller scale. Uh, but yeah, there's just a level of respect there that I, I don't think people have anymore. But um, in terms of the whole chocolate stream, enjoy your chocolates. Um, I can't, so please enjoy it for me. <laughs> it's definitely something this, this country was built on. So uh, absolutely, yeah, it's something that we're allowed to revel in, we're allowed to enjoy and absolutely indulge. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you with us, Bertie. And uh, 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 your conching no knowledge was exceptional. <laughs> um, I, I can say that I'm also grateful for jo to George for uh, the dairy milk. It's, it is exquisite. I, I'm loving it very much. Um, <laughs> and what, what do you guys think? Bring back George or return to George? What, what should be our slogan here? Mm. Return it's to gonna George. It's going to be return to, yeah. <laughs> Rev turn. <laughs> I, I want to see that trending in a couple of days' time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have got one super chat tonight. Uh, let's see if I can get it up. Uh, Makuta Teradax for two pounds sterling. Thank you very much. Lint is mint. Lint is mint. And uh, I do see down here that we have some Swiss chocolate supremacy going on in the chat as well. Uh, so Oosh, yeah, Milka. Milka is very good. Is that isn't that Swiss Milka? Oh, Delicious. I think so. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is. Yeah, yeah. They used to. I don't know if they still have them, um, but I do have one of the original milk of tins, um, oh. which used to have the, the gorgeous sort yeah. of picturesque. Um, yeah, they had the uh, mm. the milkmaids milking the cows. That was Milka's. Oh, uh, lovely alpine scene. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I think. Uh, this has been a good stream. I, I've quite enjoyed it. I've been eating chocolate while you guys have been talking, so that's that's always good. And uh, I'm very grateful to you, to all three of you. Is there anything that you would like to promote? 
any and either all of you <laughs> anything you want to promote no just love and good wishes to all <laughs> Were, were you ever you you did that you started that video in January? I did. Where I'm such it? a perfectionist. I mean, I, I I keep going to upload it, but there's another thing I want to add in. So I mm. I I'll try my best by the weekend. <laughs> Sorry no to pressure. disappoint. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just hoping by next English restoration it's out. That's that's all I. I can do. guarantee 100. It will be done by then. <laughs> oh well, everybody can look forward to that. Then you though. can pretend you've watched it like last time. Nathan. <laughs> you were caught out there, weren't you? Called out. <laughs> I'm only kidding. I'm, I do the same. <laughs> oh. Uh -oh. Yeah, Shame rumbled. Uh, um No, I just wanted to mention uh, Steam Pilled again. We do have another Steam Fair coming up this mm -hmm. year. For those who did come last year, thank you very much. Um, everyone is invited. I will be putting details on my Twitter. Um, they will also be on my other apps, Alex, that Steam guy. Uh, it'll be on his Twitter as well. Um, so it'll be lovely to see anyone and everyone who would like to come down um, and support uh, the Roby Trust. So I will put everything on Twitter that you need to know about that. <laughs> will there be some good food there? Oh, yes. Yes, there will be Steam engines, food, music. Yeah, absolutely. Everything you could wish for. Classic cars. Yep. Sounds awesome. Everybody should I go. Mean, yeah, exactly. What What's there to miss? What What, what date is it again, Birdie? Uh, good question. I've completely forgotten. It's in uh, June. June, um, June. I'm surprised okay. Alex isn't yelling at me from the kitchen at the moment because right. I forgot. What's Did you say it was in, was it, will it be in Cornwall again? Oh, or um... uh, Devon. It's in Devon, yeah. Oh, well, maybe I'll have to get a trip home to, for summer it's a, then. It's in, yeah, it's in Tavistock in Devon, uh, DOA, so I expect to see Brilliant. you there. <laughs> I'm, all right, then I'll, I'll have to give me a date and I'll try and work a holiday back. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I will, yeah, I'll put the date and all the information up on my mm -hmm. Twitter for everybody um, or anybody who would like to know more about that. So, mm -hmm. so awesome. save the date. And, of course, you're both panellists on Women's Hour, so everybody yes. should go and watch that on a Friday evening. Is there is there a topic for this week? Yeah, sorry. Uh, we haven't even got that far yet. Um, the last topic was the friend zone. If you hadn't haven't seen oh, that one yeah, yet, that's quite right. Mm -hmm. I need to catch up with that too, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was last week's one. So go mm -hmm. ahead and watch that one. We have not decided um, on this week yet, as usual, because yeah, that's that's just how we roll. We tend to decide on the day. So <laughs> awesome, awesome. And Rupert, anything you would like to promote? Uh, yes, there's the most recent uh, essay that I wrote for Praxaki, uh, Cyclical mm -hmm. History, A Brief Intro to Glob, Tainter, and Turchin, which uh, is linking into the forthcoming um, book by uh, Academic Agent. Uh, sort of a little bit of a, a look and my particular take on uh, three of the writers that he, he's covering there mm -hmm. in uh, Prophets of Doom. Um, other than that, yeah, I think that's I think that's pretty much it for now. Nothing nothing else is uh, on the immediate horizon, but yeah, there's always things in the works. That sounds excellent. Uh, I'll definitely be going away and reading that after I munch my the rest of my dairy milk. Um, the I just wanted to plug something that our good friend uh, Black Horse has has just started. It's very uh, related to uh, what we're doing on this channel. So it's called the Red Ensign. It's on Substack. Canada, a people, not a post national state. Welcome to the Red Ensign, a publication dedicated to highlighting the achievements and advancing the future of Anglo-Canadian people. It's going to be produced by a small team who are trying to preserve uh, Canadian culture and heritage for the for posterity and ensuring the memory of its achievements are kept in honour. And so, you know, that's what we've been doing on this channel for England, essentially. Uh, and so I'd encourage everybody to, to go and subscribe to the red ensign go and support it and uh i i can't wait to see what uh they produce there for for canada and we, we should be trying to encourage all like i'd love I, I think the old glory club's kind of doing that with america too hopefully we'll get one for scotland at some point uh something like that for scotland but yes uh and and other nations too but yes go and go and support black horse he's a he's a good lad and uh he's doing good work and next week, uh, we'll be back again on Tuesday. I don't, I don't have a topic yet. This is the first time I've not had a topic in a long time. So uh, maybe put if there's something you really want 
uh, put it in the comments and uh, I'll consider it. Uh, maybe we'll do sweet teas in the future, right? We, we've done chocolate, but we've yeah, not done sweet teas. Sweet teas would be nice. Yes, mm. yes. And penny uh, sweets. <laughs> penny sweets. Exactly, exactly. Sugar mice, sugar mice. Yeah. Mine's <laughs> I feel like there's there's a lot of uh, vintage sweets out there that we, we definitely need to talk about and where the hell they've gone. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've not seen UFOs for ages, the uh, flying saucers. Yeah, oh. right. <laughs> where have they gone, actually? That's a really good point. <laughs> where have they gone? <laughs> the deep questions. The, they're in Area 52, of course. Um, <laughs> Chinese balloons. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yes, uh, till next time. Uh, God bless you all, and wherever you are, whoever you are, I hope you have a good rest of the day or evening. Good night, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Good night.